Amen. Well, in case you haven't uh, got the name of the series that we're in at the moment, it is Pure Sex. Just in case you hadn't got that. And uh, last week, Andrew looked at uh, friendship in the context of the covenant community. And we did covenant together as we shared bread and wine and prayed for each other. And he said that it is how we understand ourselves, our identity, that will enable us to uh, kind of relate to one another as friends in Christ. And so he said we are created, first of all, and we are created male and female. That's who we are. But we are also new creation in Christ. So we are children of God above everything else. However we define ourselves as male or female or straight or gay, those things are secondary and derivative to who we are in Christ. And then that identity is worked out in relationship within the covenant community of the church. And that's what led him to talk about Friendship, And we're going to look a little bit more at that tonight because uh, we are looking at marriage. And friendship is at the heart of marriage. And really this evening what we're going to touch on is what difference marriage makes, if any, to a relationship. What's the purpose of marriage? Why would you ever want to get married in the first place? And lastly, how do you prepare for it? Because if we're honest, very few of us have resigned ourselves to the fact that we're never going to get married, the hope always remains unless we have a particular call to celibacy. So we need to ask the question, how can we be ready? How can we prepare ourselves uh, for married life whilst we remain single? And then next week we're going to dig a little bit deeper into uh, sex. Uh, So I'm sure you'll have some questions around that for, uh, and Rich and Louisa will be looking at that. And then lastly, two weeks time, we'll have this Q&A session. Before we get into marriage, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm married to Joanne, who I met at university. I had just graduated. She uh, was a student when we got together. Uh, so, and we married, I was 24, and she was 22. And we have been married for 14 years this year, in September. September the 3rd, we got married. That's not bad going, is it? Uh, And I have conducted a number of weddings as a clergyman in the Church of England. Uh, It's great fun uh, doing a wedding. Uh, Let me tell you about one of them. Uh, They were friends of ours who uh, were actually getting married on a Greek... Well, they were having a ceremony on a Greek island, but they needed to do the church bit first. And I was very clear to them this was the real wedding. Uh, But it was small and it was quick. And uh, uh, and I uh, remember on the morning... The groom turns up wearing a top hat and a nose ring, and, uh, and his hair was at the side like that. He was quite a character, massive long beard, and uh, we, he said, I need to get some flowers for the wedding. And I said, okay, I was wearing uh, all black with my dog collar on, as uh, we used to do for weddings. And, uh, and so we went into Spitalfields Market to the local florist, and we walked in, and uh, my friend said, uh, I need to get some flowers for my wedding later on this morning. And she looked at him with his nose ring and his ridiculous top hat and hair. And then she glanced at me wearing a doll collar. And I said, yes, I am a real vicar. And yes, he is getting married. And uh, I'm not sure she believed us. But he was going to all this trouble to get one of these. A piece of paper. This is a wedding certificate. And what you do on a wedding day is you get given one of those, obviously filled in, and you have to sign two of these. This is exciting, isn't it? This is a big deal. You're not allowed to uh, photograph an open marriage certificate that's been filled in, like that one. So what you have to do before a a photograph is taken, you have to turn over the page and it needs to be blank. What difference does this make? This piece of paper... Why does it matter? Why do people spend tens of thousands of pounds uh, on a wedding day where they sign three pieces of paper? Because if you have one of those, if you've got one of these sheets, you're married. What difference does it make? What's the point of all of that? What is marriage in the first place? I find it amazing, really, but I probably ought to say that Christian marriage is the lifelong covenant, monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. 
It says it in the passage here. Paul uh, quotes uh, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, right at the beginning. In verse 31, he says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. God invents marriage, and it is this lifelong covenant commitment a faithfulness between a man and a woman. And that's what is at stake in the debate in our nation today. But does it matter anymore? Do you know 12.2 million couples are married in the UK? That's down about 100,000 in the last decade. Uh, There were 120,000 divorces in 2010. That was up 4.9% on the year before. 13% of men and women in the UK live together. They cohabit, as the statisticians like to say. And that's a huge increase in number uh, over the last 30 years. And most of those who are living together but aren't married, their relationship tends to last about two years, and they either break up or they go on to get married. Only 4% of those who are living together outside of marriage actually last for more than 10 years. And the reality is is that uh, living together before you get married actually has profound effects on the marriage itself. You may not know that. So if you live together with the person you eventually marry, you are far more likely to divorce them. You are far more likely to be unfaithful to them. And the impact on children, both educationally and emotionally, in uh, relationships where the parents live together but aren't married is significant. So marriage matters. But why are there these effects? Why is it when you sign this certificate, or whether you do or you don't, seems to make a real difference to the relationship you're part of? Well, I've got a few things to say about that. I think the first thing is that marriage redefines love. Marriage redefines love. You see, love is not an emotional desire. It's committed service. And if you think about it, without marriage, romantic love is almost always selfish because we're dominated by our own tastes, our own temperament, our feelings, our impulses. Even those feelings of intense love can often actually be a delight, a joy in being loved. A love of affection and esteem from someone else. And the truth is, is that marriage helps that kind of romantic love to fulfill itself. Because it is a radical act of self-giving. That sense of obligation where we commit ourselves, where we make vows and enter into an illegal covenant actually frees us from ourselves. You see, true love is defined by unselfish actions far more than it is by affectionate feelings. And that's precisely why here Paul says husbands ought to love their wives. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? If you think about our culture's understanding of love. Paul is saying here, choose to love, decide to love. It's an exercise of the will. And so husbands ought to love their wives. Marriage redefines love. Marriage also provides a safe space for this love to flourish. When you get married, you don't have to sell yourself anymore. Sometimes that means you just let yourself go. It doesn't have to mean that. But what it does mean is that sex no longer has to be about performance and uh, technique. What you can just find having, you know, just constantly needing to impress your partner. It's exhausting. Marriage creates space where you can be vulnerable. It offers security so that you can open up. Where you can be yourself. and enjoy acceptance and grace and welcome. It's marriage that makes a home, that creates a home for those who 
a husband and wife. But marriage also brings real freedom. Marriage brings real freedom. You see, love makes promises, doesn't it? If you think about it, it makes promises. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, when we fall in love, we uh, naturally express affection for the person we love, but also we want to make promises to them, don't we? I'm not going to call out anybody who has just got engaged, so don't worry about that. Um, But marriage involves a promise. It involves a vow. And those vows, they're not about our current feelings. They're not about our current love for each other. There you are at the altar, and it's like, yes, I promise. What do you promise? You don't say, I'm in love now. Isn't that marvelous? Let's celebrate it. I'll sign. You say, I will love forever, as long as you both shall live. And it's that promise of future love that brings us real freedom. Because what it says is, this relationship is not fated. This relationship is not determined. This relationship is not limited or out of control. I am making a promise. I am choosing, we are choosing our future together. We will be free in our love for each other as we get married. So what do you get? You get a piece of paper. But that piece of paper redefines love. It provides space for you to flourish in your relationship. And it gives you real, genuine freedom. That's what you get. But what's it for? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. What's the purpose of marriage? Why get married at all? Well, let me say at this point that it's not about social status. It's not about a stable society. It's not even primarily about raising children, although that is central to it. It's not about romance. It's not about emotional happiness. Again, look at uh, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. It's all about our sanctification. It's all about being made holy, about our cleansing, about being presented at the end of the day without spot, a radiant bride to the heavenly groom, to Jesus himself. So Tim Keller in his book, which is over there, which we've already recommended, The Meaning of Marriage. If you haven't bought it, do get it. It's brilliant. Mine's quite dog-eared and underlined. It's full of wisdom. This is what he says, and I think this is inspirational. Marriage is for helping each other to become our future glory selves. The new creatures that God will eventually make us. The common horizon husband and wife look towards is the throne and the holy, spotless and blameless nature we will have. That's a great goal to have as we think about marriage, isn't it? What he's saying is that marriage makes us more like Jesus. That's the point of it. So as we look at, our, at a potential um, spouse, as we think about getting engaged, as we look at the relationship we're in already, God is calling us to catch a vision of the person that he is creating. And he is saying, be committed to that person's holiness. Be committed to your spouse's holiness. And you find yourself in that wonderful paradox where you are encouraging the person you love to love Jesus more than you. Because marriage makes us more like Jesus. And that, of course, changes our definition of compatibility, doesn't it? If marriage is all about erotic love then compatibility must be all about sexual chemistry. That's what you're looking for. You want your husband or wife to be hot. And that's all that matters. If marriage is about um, social uh, status, 
then compatibility means looking for someone who's of the same social class as you, who has the same tastes of fine wine that you have, or who has the same aspirations and ambitions as you, or the same lifestyle. That's what compatibility looks like. But if marriage is primarily about your holiness as husband and wife together, then compatibility means you're primarily, above everything else, looking for a friend. You're looking for a companion to live your life with. And Christian marriage has always emphasized friendship. And so this talk really about marriage is just an extension of what Andrew was talking about when he was talking about covenant community and friendship last week. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 17 uh, speaks of the spouse and it uses the word, the Hebrew word, alap. And actually that can also be translated as your best friend. And so when, you're think, when we think about our marriage partners, our spouses, our husbands or our wives, actually the qualities of friendship are also the qualities of a healthy marriage. And that means constancy, commitment matters. Transparency, honesty matters in a marriage. Sympathy also matters in a marriage. And by that I don't mean understanding each other and saying, there, there, giving them a hug and saying, it's okay, I understand. What I mean by sympathy is a common passion, a common purpose, something we have in common. Because as Andrew said last week, friendship is never about itself. It shares something together, a reason for being. And that's why Christian marriage means Christian husband and wife. Don't marry somebody who isn't a Christian. Don't even go there. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. So Christian marriage changes how we understand compatibility. But also marriage changes our approach to conflict. Because we're less concerned about our needs being met. We're less concerned about fairness. We begin to recognize that marriage isn't about competition and quid, a quid pro quo. It's about the other, their well-being. We want them to thrive, them to flourish. It doesn't mean that we avoid conflict, but we can recognize that God can work through conflict, through our own failure, our own fears, and he can change us in those moments of honesty and accountability. It's part of the spiritual life. I mean, Joanne and I, uh, we have a fiery relationship. We had a very fiery relationship in the first five years of married life. If we went out together, uh, I would invariably get a kick under the table or a jab in the ribs because I was saying something that she just thought was inappropriate. And on the way home, she would say, you ruined my evening because you said that. And, I'd be, oh, and we'd have this big row. It was really difficult. But do you know what? I am holier today than I was then because of my wife. <laughs> That's true. It cost her, it was difficult for her to say those things to me. It was difficult for me to hear those things, but I'm glad that she did. So what's it for? Marriage makes us holy, and it changes our definition of compatibility, and it changes our approach to conflict. But what do you do while you wait? What if you're there tonight, and this may be the majority of you, still waiting to get married, not knowing if you ever will be married, not completely sure if you want to get married? Well, a few things. First thing, don't idolize marriage. Husbands and wives really do make popular idols. But the truth is, is that romance, even marriage, won't satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. Spouses always disappoint. Ask my wife. <laughs> they always fail. They always let you down. A spouse can never replace God. And marriage never fills that hole 
but from time to time aches. So don't idolize marriage. Instead, actually celebrate singleness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 7 that being single is good. It's a good thing. Christianity is the first religion on the planet ever to hold up singleness as a great way of life. All other religions had always been about family ties and holding things together. But because of that future hope that God has done for us something that our families could never do, suddenly singleness became an option for Christian disciples. But how does that work out in practice? How can you really celebrate your singleness, even when it hurts? The first thing is to work on your identity. Work on your identity as a child of God above everything else. Paul says that in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, single nor married. He doesn't say that, but he might as well have done. When we realize that we are children of God and that relationship as our father looks down on us and says, you are my child, I love you, with you I'm well pleased. When we let that sink into our hearts, then we can enjoy singleness as a gift, not a curse. And one of the ways that we can do that is to work out our singleness in community with one another. Let's talk about it. Let's pray together for one another. Submit yourselves to community input. And also let's recognize that there are seasons when it really isn't best to be seeking marriage. That might be a moment of transition where you're changing jobs or you're moving to a new area. Or it might be uh, an emotionally charged moment, a demanding moment like a, a loss of a loved one or the end of another relationship. In those moments, celebrate singleness. Secondly, what I'll say to you is avoid, thirdly actually, avoid apocalyptic romance. You know what I mean. Avoid apocalyptic romance. Don't get emotionally involved with a non-believer. I was reading the meaning of marriage in a a coffee shop off Brick Lane, and uh, there were a couple, they weren't a couple actually, there was a man and a woman having a coffee just next to me. And uh, they were talking about the guy's relationship that had just come to an end. Neither of them were Christians, but the guy had just finished with a Christian woman. And he said it was a nightmare going out with a Christian. They didn't have anything in common. She wanted to pray with him. He didn't want to do that. He felt pressured to pray. And he thought that was out of, out of line. So this guy called it off. He said he realized he couldn't live with this woman because they didn't share the same values. Now I realize that it is easy to find a date these days. That there are loads of dating websites. There are great apps like Blender and Badoo. Not good, not good places to go. But actually, the best dating site of all is here. It's the church. You don't need to go any further. So don't get emotionally involved with an unbeliever. It always ends in disaster. It really does. It is never worth it. But, on the other hand, when you do get a date with somebody who's a Christian, don't get intense. It's just not attractive, is it? I I remember two friends, uh, young guys they were, and uh, they were both excited about getting uh, a first date with a girl that uh, they thought uh, could be the one. And on on the first date, the guy said to this woman, I'm looking for a wife. (laughs) He didn't get a second date. The second guy was even worse. The second guy at the dinner table, the conversation was going okay, he said, God has told me that I'm going to marry you. He didn't get a second date either. There is no need to be desperate. Okay? (laughs) Don't make me giggle. It's important. Don't rush. You don't have to be desperate. 
And don't get passionate too quickly. Okay, don't get passionate too quickly. This was a mistake that I made repeatedly as a young man. Do you know, I was engaged three times. John was the third person that I was engaged to. I was sexually active before I was married. I made the mistake in my relationships. Uh, I was a serial monogamist, so I would go from one relationship to the other. But I made the mistake of essentially picking up with the new girlfriend where I had left off with the old one. So I would get, it would get kind of physically heavier and heavier and heavier as I went through. I would stay over if I was with them and it had got late. We would often drink together a bottle of wine. And it meant that I didn't wait. I had sex before I met Joanne. And you know, I still regret that. And it's not just that I feel guilty about that. And I've received forgiveness from that. God has been very gracious. But it affected my sex life with my wife for about the first seven years of our marriage. It was not easy. And it was because I didn't wait. So avoid apocalyptic romance. Don't get emotionally involved with a non-believer. Don't get intense. But don't get passionate too quickly. But also, don't put off marriage. Don't wait until you've made it. You're rich. You have a house. You have a car. You have a career. Don't hold out for the perfect partner. Become one of those people who's impossible to please. Usually that means guys are looking for a supermodel and girls are looking for a millionaire. I used to think that was a stereotype, but usually things are stereotypes for a reason. This is what uh, an ethicist said who actually married someone who uh, he later discovered uh, really struggled with mental health issues. And uh, he said this, you always marry the wrong person. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we marry, if we first marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. That's true, isn't it? So don't put off marriage either. And particularly if you're getting older, get more serious about seeking marriage. Don't drift along. And more important than that, don't become a fake spouse for somebody who you want to marry but is unwilling to marry you, who strings you along and won't commit. So how do you live while you wait? Don't idolize marriage. Instead, celebrate singleness, avoid apocalyptic romance, and lastly, don't put it off. So just to, to sum up as I finish, where do we begin? What do you get? You get a piece of paper that redefines love, that provides you with a space to flourish, that really brings real freedom to your relationship. What's it for? Well, marriage is all about your holiness, the sanctification of you and your spouse. And that changes your definition of compatibility, what you're looking for in a future spouse, and it changes your approach to conflict. And what do you do while you wait? Don't idolize marriage. Instead, celebrate singleness, avoid apocalyptic romance at all costs, but do not put it off. Because the truth is, is that marriage is a beautiful thing. It is well worth waiting for. But it is just a signpost. It's just a signpost. It is an act of commitment that points to the ultimate act of commitment. 
where Jesus made a covenant with his father to come to this earth to die in our place for our sins where he said your will not mine be done not because we are attractive or rich we abandoned him and turned away from him and yet he stayed he remained faithful even to the point of death And because Jesus stayed, then we can too. Let me pray.